Hello, we'll uh, get underway. So welcome to uh, our webinar today. It's on uh, fan curves and system curves, how they intersect. Um, it's a little tongue in cheek, but uh, there's some interesting uh, uh, little uh, quirks that we're going to talk about today and little traps and pitfalls to be aware of. So as a quick overview, Today we're going to talk a little bit about a system curve and we're going to go a little bit beyond just sort of the basics and uh, and understanding what actually is going on um, as you consider your system curve for your fan system. Um, often that's integrated as part of your process um, and also the uh, effect of when you bring the system together, how that actually changes what you might expect from a design point of view your system curve to be. Then, of course, how that interacts with the fan curve. Um, and then we're going to have some examples. I'm going to talk a little bit about developing your system curve, which ultimately comes back to uh, measurements. And in the real world, of course, that means, you know, tackling the challenge of how we measure flow, how we measure pressure, and then obviously the errors associated with that. And, and often that's the biggest challenge, sifting between the noise and the signal and, and, and getting on top of what's going on. Um, then, of course, we're uh, going to talk about then using that system curve to your advantage and in particular focusing on how we can use these tools as a de-bottlenecking and sort of an efficiency opportunity and we've got a very interesting little case study to share. Um, so on that note, um, we'll, uh, we'll get stuck into, I guess, first of all, the, the first question is, well, what is a system curve? Now. Ultimately, as you see down the bottom there, pressure flow relationship of the system. So typically speaking for a system as we increase flow, the pressure drop in terms of the static pressure drop required to supply or maintain that flow is going to increase. And as most people generally rightly uh, assume as a good rule of thumb, typically that's sort of a parabolic or squared relationship with pressure uh, being roughly proportional to the velocity squared. Now, what's interesting later today is we're going to show you some real examples where that doesn't always hold true. Um, now, for some of you might uh, be a little surprised at that, but it's just a really good friendly reminder. But nonetheless, the reality is, is as you increase flow, typically your pressure is going to increase in terms of the uh, driving force to move the air or gas stream through your system. Now, how do we come up with our system curve? Well, what you can do is as you look through our system, we've got our fan sitting over here. Now, this is a fairly simple, modest um, system in that we've only got a single fan driving the process. Now, most industrial applications, we probably in this instance have an exhaust fan somewhere over here as well. But to keep it simple, we've obviously got some sort of inlet filter obviously some transition duct into the fan inlet, then post the fan we have an expansion through some sort of cooling or humidity control device, um, followed by obviously more duct transitions, sort of a heat exchanger, um, and then obviously some ducting to get our treated air, which has been dehumidified, cooled, heated, etc., cetera, um, to our process vessel. Um, then you might have an exhaust cyclone, obviously uh, particulate emissions these days is quite an a, uh, important topic and so with that in mind obviously um, you know filtering uh, particulates out at the back end, um, you might also have a bag house on there, we've left that off this particular example. Okay and so what you end up doing is each one of those components as you lift there we've got a building inlet duct We've got a fan inlet filter, we've got a fan inlet duct, we have a fan outlet expansion, we have a heat exchanger one, a humidity uh, or dehumidifier, um, some sort of interface between the two, or ducting could be another name used there. Then we've got a second heat exchanger, then more ducting to the process, we then have the process vessel, we then have the cyclone, and then what you can see is each one of those components is going to have a system curve or a pressure drop requirement for a certain flow rate. Now, of course, you then get your total system curve as being a sum of those individual components. However, what's interesting, 
is the actual system curve when you go to measure something like this, shown here in, in orange as opposed to the, uh, the, the darker orange, is quite a bit higher. So our cumulative sum of all our components is sitting just under sort of 4,000 pascals. But in reality, as a system, it's closer to 5,000. And so the question we want to ask ourselves is why? Why is, uh, why is this system pressure drop, or therefore our system curve effectively for the same flow that much higher? And the answer is what we refer to as a system resistance effect. And so what this really is, is that it's an acknowledgement that individually between each of those components, we've got additional losses that may not necessarily be fully captured. So for example, we've got losses around the inlet ducting of the fan might be less than ideal at the outlet to the fan. Uh, we've got um, losses associated with transitions in the duct and, uh, and the like beyond what we might expect or anticipate. Um, inlet and exit effects of process vessels and cyclones, all of these sum up to additional pressure drop that uh, ends up materialising and this is where if you measured the uh, system curve of individual components you don't necessarily capture all of these additional losses. And so what happens is and it's important to realise that your combined interaction between the multiple systems can lead to a higher actual system resistance or static pressure drop for a given flow. Now I guess the question then arises, well, okay, would, is this just a theoretical thing? Is this just an academic exercise? Or does this really matter? And so if let's look at what this looks like on our fan curve system curve plot. So what we have is if we have our design system curve here in the maroon, okay, and then we have our actual system curve here in the green. If we have a required flow rate of our six cubic metres a second, um, what's going to happen is in reality with our higher system curve, if we leave our fan with a fixed speed, might be at a certain pulley ratio or leaving the VSD set at the same speed, um, the actual flow delivered is going to be somewhat less sort of sitting around the five and a half. So we will drop back or move up the fan curve from the uh, the intersection point lower down up to where it intersects the new fan curve. Now to maintain our required flow rate of six cubic metres a second in this example, we have an increased static pressure requirement, which means we're either going to need to speed our fan up, assuming that we can, or have a bigger fan. Now, the alternative, of course, is, is to have to identify where those losses are and try and remove those with some remedial action. So the key thing here is, is understanding that when you have a system as a whole, we can have these additional losses that mean ultimately our system is going to be dragged back in terms of flow rate or dragged up in terms of pressure drop. Now, you'll note that even dragging back the flow rate and, and losing capacity, you're still going to have an increase in pressure drop anyway. Now, the, the tricky part here, of course, is if you don't do anything, ultimately what this means, it's going to cost you in terms of capacity of your system or process. Now, some instances that may be okay. In others, that might be a problem. So what are some of the examples that lead to these system effects? Well, to start with, a key one is fan installation. So what we're talking about here is how the fans get installed. Um, we're not talking about the uh, the alignment of things and other sort of mechanically based things, although they too have an effect somewhat. The uh, But the primary thing is if you can see there, there's some really good examples taken out of the fan source book where you've got really poor duct design. First of all, top left uh, with bad flow coming out of the fan. You've got a lot of disturbance, which is obviously going to create quite a bit of lost energy and inefficiency. Um, and one in the middle, we've got a really poor ducted inlet to a fan. And of course, that's going to mean the air is going to be preferentially on one side of the fan, so the fan's going to underperform. Now, you could look at this as a combination of you've got additional losses in the system, or alternately, 
your design and installation means that you're compromising in the fan and moving the fan off its fan curve and it's really a combination of the two. Now on our third one here to the far right you've got once again a really poor ducted inlet to this particular fan and you can see obviously that's going to have some additional pressure drop across the front of the fan and also impact directly on the fan's performance. So ultimately the fan installation becomes important in terms of impacting on the fan performance, can uh, lower flow, um, less pressure development by the fan, i.e. it's going to move it off the fan curve. Uh, generally these things are detrimental and so you're, you're coming below the fan curve as opposed to going above it obviously. Okay, and so we, we can shift that fan curve and sometimes that can be quite significant. There was a project we were involved with a number of years ago where a uh, poor installation resulted in over a, a 30 to 40 percent drop in the performance of the fan and it was literally due to the ducting configuration around the fan. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the fan itself and when that was corrected obviously the fan performance was recovered. Um, so fan efficiency obviously as a result can be significantly reduced um, and if you've put poured money and good capital into a higher efficiency fan, that often can be a wasted investment due to, uh, to poor installation. Now uh, that, that also means you might save some installation costs but ultimately it's going to cost you a lot more in additional operating cost and expenses. The other thing to bear in mind here if you put your maintenance hat on for a few minutes, the uh, the bad um, non-uniform loading of fans by having air on one side not the other can also lead to mechanically related challenges in terms of uh, excitation and vibration of impellers and, uh, and basically an imbalance in load which then obviously can lead to other problems. Um, so th and the problem of course down there, the really important point to, to think about is these things can lead to significant sort of increases in life cycle costs and, and ultimately de be detrimental to the life of a uh, plant. Now carrying on from this, if you think downstream from the fan, if we don't allow for flow development after the fan, um, we're not going to get sufficient pressure recovery. Ultimately that leads to reduced fan performance and I think it's really important to, um, to note here that everyone when they see a fan curve, when you look at the fine print at the bottom of the page, and unfortunately here the fine print is often really fine or it's often been uh, cut off when it was being photocopied and put into your manual. The, uh, the fine print st stipulates the fan curve is for that fan with a particular installation configuration. Now the, uh, the uh, Air Movement and Control Association, AM, AM, AMCA, um, have a great document out, I've got the reference at the end of the presentation today where they talk about the four main uh, types of fan installation and A, B, C and D and this is really with respect to whether it's a free inlet outlet or ducted inlet and a free outlet vice versa or ducted both in and out. Now what of course happens is when you've got those ducts in and out that can change the performance of the fan. The other thing to note is that fan performance or fan curve is based on a specific uh, gas, typically air, and that will be based at some normally standard uh, air conditions might be 20 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere for example. Now of course if you're a, uh, if it's a hot exhaust gas fan, it could be running at 100 degrees, couple of hundred degrees which is quite significantly different. Hopefully in that case your suppliers will be providing you with a, uh, a fan curve for the, the indicated or expected operating point not a 20 degree sort of clean air. So it's important to understand that these things are all different and, and are based on full pressure recovery. Now what do we mean by this? Well if we look at the uh, picture down here on the right You'll notice that as the air is coming out of the fan, if you measure a profile right at the outlet of a fan, it's not uncommon on some fans to sort of have a 10 to 1 ratio on velocity. You could have sort of 40, 50 metres a second at the top here and sort of 4 or 5 down the bottom and in some cases as it's indicated there slightly negative flow. Now of course what happens is if you don't allow good flow development after the fan, that 
dynamic head in that high velocity air doesn't actually get fully recovered, it gets wasted and so the performance of the fan is somewhat less than you would expect. So obviously a critical part here is making sure that not only that you select the right fan, but you get the right duct installation and sizing of that duct to uh, gain these efficiencies. Otherwise, of course, um, these are going to be additional losses. Um, too many bends, as we've got listed there, um, can be a problem. Now, for those of you, like most of us here in New Zealand, you're typically using an existing plant, and so unfortunately you've inherited the sins of the past, and so it's very difficult to rip everything out and change it, and, and in most instances when you do have an opportunity to do something, the building that you've got everything situated in is uh, already sort of locked in, you don't have a lot of extra space, and so ultimately those space constraints remain. Now what of course happens, and we'll cover this in a more detail in a future webinar, there's really important uh, strategies that you can employ um, with flow control guide vanes and the like to improve airflow in these situations so you can recover um, some of these losses and improve the performance of the system. Now the other thing of course is when you think about your process unit or some reaction vessel or process vessel, they may have excessive pressure drop. Now that could be because production has decided they want more capacity so they've cranked everything up. It could be that there's uh, things fouling up, the heat exchanger has been heavily fouled over the years, um, something's been missed, and these things happen. Um, you know, so it's these sorts of things where in running and operating a plant, there should be a, a strong emphasis on keeping an eye on some critical process metrics. And static pressure drop is a really cheap, easy uh, variable to measure and track and easy to have alarms and trigger points to say, hey, look, that's too high, we need to investigate. And as you learn to know your system, you'll very quickly be able to identify those one or two bad actors that you can follow up with. Okay, so what does this translate to in terms of where the fans, fan curve and the system curve meets? Now if we've got a good design and we, we've incorporated our system curve correctly, we can have our curve hit and, and obviously design and size our system so we're running at what's close to our best efficiency point. So you know, we can have our fan running at sort of 85% efficiency. Now, of course, what happens, either undersizing or oversizing the fans can result in being quite a ways away from that efficiency point. Now, of course, the problem in doing that is, yes, the fan will run, yes, you might be able to get away with it, yes, you can still meet production targets and so forth, but the question you've got to ask yourself, what is the cost? Now, in the instance of, a, uh, of an undersized fan, you're going to struggle to get the pressure that you need. Um, and an oversized fan, obviously what you're going to need to do is you're going to have to either ramp up a, uh, a damper somewhere and have therefore a whole lot of additional uh, pressure loss that uh, you don't need, which is just an energy waste, or ultimately the other end of it you could be undersized and, and therefore not be able to meet your targets. So, so the key thing is to understand where those points are and be close to it. And of course these days, um, even if you don't have a VSD, you should be able to uh, look, um, if, you, if you're not in a direct drive situation, if you're uh, driving by a pulley, then you can do a pulley change, change the speed and so forth. Now, I guess a cautionary note there, if you're going to do that, it really does pay to consult with uh, the fan supplier or service agent to make sure that the impeller is rated to be sped up, especially lowering the speed is not so much of a challenge. However, having said that, there's a number of instances that I'm aware of where actually slowing fans down uh, can be beneficial and speeding fans up can be beneficial in terms of vibration levels and, and, and so forth. So you've got to be careful um, and, and track these things and be have appropriate measures in place as part of commissioning that change to ensure that you're not introducing something that you don't want to. Now I want to talk a little bit more specifically um, about where this interaction point may be. 
Now this is a chart that's taken from the Department of Energy in the US. They have a fan source book, it's available as a free download um, from the DOE website. There's a link um, and, a, and a picture of it at the end of the presentation today. Now what you're seeing here is if I go back, you'll notice that we've got a nice simple fan curve and this fan curve gives you the impression that the uh, as we reduce our flow rate, the pressure supplied by the fan just goes back to a maximum. Now in reality, the fan curves aren't actually that simple. And what you'll find is it's quite common, certainly for a centrifugal fan, to uh, have a fan curve that's shaped a little bit more like this. Now what of course happens, you can have a, a family of system curves, depending on where your system lies, and you'll notice that the key parameter in terms of control here is the slope of our system curve as indicated here and in particular the slope in relation to the slope of the fan curve and where it intersects. Now I'll draw your attention up here oops, sorry, to the top and you'll see that we've got a really nasty region of instability and so if we have an oversized fan and we end up operating up in this region, the fan is really actually throttled right back at this point. And the problem we have is we can have a system curve with a very similar slope to the, uh, the fan curve. Now what that does of course is that can be an incredibly unstable operating point and very subtle shifts can mean that the system can fluctuate wildly then of course that can in itself induce some rather nasty oscillations. I was recently involved with a project actually with a coupled fan system on a, um, a gas burning plant and it was actually a really good example of this where the system curve was changing through a ramp up as, as the burner was being ramped up in terms of its heat capacity and with a research loop involved in that system it got to an instability region where everything fell apart to the point where the, uh, the gas combustion was uh, incredibly dangerous and oscillating, just about flaming out, then surging. And this is a classic example where our system curve and fan curve aren't well aligned and we had um, a number of challenges that had to be detuned to uh, prevent those uh, dangerous uh, combinations occurring. So it's very, very important to understand as you're diagnosing a system to, to understand and figure out where you are in relation to your system curve and your fan curve. Now another example is if you're sitting in this region on the fan curve, <coughs> excuse me, you'll notice that for the same pressure drop we can have potentially quite a shift in flow rate or vice versa, a very small change in pressure can have a substantial change in flow rate. Now from a control point of view, we do not want to operate our systems in this region and it can cause quite a few headaches. Now the other thing of course, in a practical sense, if you're there and you might think, well our control system's really stable, but with a uh, an airflow system, it could be as simple as a change in the wind direction outside and change in static pressure with the corner of the building that your intake filter is on can be a subtle shift. I know up and down the country as we go to factories, we talk to a lot of operators and they, uh, they're absolutely adamant that um, they know when the weather's shifting outside because they can see it in the plant. Now they don't understand why, but when they're there shift after shift looking at things they, they observe and they know when they realise that when the weather change is coming through, it's going to have an impact. What they've learnt, without actually necessarily understanding the, the, the physics of what's going on, is we've got a slight minor upset to a condition somewhere and if the system in the plant is such that it's just at the wrong spot, we can have quite a shift and so compensating for that can be quite a challenge. So really, really important to, uh, I can't overstate this enough, You've got to be very careful in determining where you're operating on the fan curve and how your system is responding. Okay, so with all of those scary warnings and cautions and everything else out of the way, 
what does our system curve actually provide us other than avoiding the calamities that I've just uh, you know sort of highlighted I guess you could argue I've just shared all of the scary uh, worst case scenarios as opposed to everything else that normally happens and everyone gets away with well the key thing about the system curve is is it's ultimately giving us an indication of what the available gas flow rate is at different production rates now it's not uncommon for our gas flow rate in a lot of systems to be the unknown variable it's often not measured or if it is measured more often than not the flow meters reading incorrectly because it hasn't been set up right um, but what it does do even if you have what I refer to as a wheelbarrow meter you and I mean that by saying you might not be necessarily measuring airflow but you're measuring a number and at least is as things go up and down your number might not might go up and down it might not necessarily be an accurate representation of the figure of the actual true flow rate but it gives you an indication so uh, obviously you want to have a better result if you can get it but the good thing about understanding what your system curve is doing is you can develop an understanding of what's happening and then potentially how you can improve the process where are the losses those system effects we talked about earlier um, how they come into the mix. Now we have uh, available potential for increasing the gas flow rate. How steep is the system curve as, as the flow increases? If it's very steep, the bottom line is we're going to have limited potential to increase our flow rate. Now if it's relatively flat, there's uh, room to move and an and opportunity perhaps, subject to other, other constraints. And of course the uh, you know the current fan may or may not enable you to get a production increase now where does the system curve fit on the fan curve is the fan operating efficiently you know these are sorts of some of the questions that you can start to get your head around does the fan provide a smooth change in flow rate as we as we change in pressure or is the control very unsteady and unstable Okay, so if there's an instability in the system, um, going through and understanding what's going on in the system, you should be able to identify where the problems arise. So as we develop a system curve, we're going to need pressure and flow. Now the reality is, is we're going to need to actually measure that. As we indicated earlier, theoretically uh, looking at that is not really going to um, cut the mustard. So uh, multiple operating points are going to be required to develop a system curve. Um, it might sound like stating the obvious, but one point is not enough. One point just tells you, well, the fan can do this and this much pressure. It has no indication as to how steep the curve is. And uh, as generally, as you've been uh, taught years ago in, uh, in school, no doubt, if you want to draw a line, we try and... Uh, have at least three points rather than two now obviously the more points we have the better now in a production environment of course this can be a little bit of a challenge so whether it's during a cleaning or at the end of a run start of a run there's sort of creative uh, ways and means to perhaps look at trying to identify and, and, and get these sorts of uh, figures now that's where between startup production and also shutdown can provide chances to get um, those additional points now one of the key things to be mindful of there is that you don't well you need to be careful that startup shutdown and production could have different particulate loading in the airflow which can change things so for example on a cyclone with clean air the pressure drop is quite different to when the uh, the, the pressure drop of the cyclone when it's actually got a, uh, a powder or, or particulate loading on it and what's interesting about a cyclone is actually you find with a particulate loading the pressure drop actually can go down rather than up. So there's little traps and pitfalls that you need to be mindful of. Now the other thing just to come back um, once again it's almost stating the obvious but it's worth doing anyway. One of our three points we don't want one of those to be our zero zero. Now you could argue yes that might be a point um, but not one that's uh, all that meaningful. Now having said that, there's a number of systems actually with um, with, uh, with a zero zero setting, i.e. The, the fans off, you could still have a natural draft through your system, which actually means, you know, the whole concept of zero zero is an interesting one. You may not actually have a zero zero point even with nothing on, there will be a flow rate, and if you have a flow rate, you will have some sort of pressure differential. <clears throat> 
Um, so obviously getting some spread between those points also becomes important, but then the accuracy of our measurements ultimately um, come into the mix as well. So, so developing our system curve ultimately is going to come down to some flow measurement. So accurate flow measurement is going to be difficult in most instances. We're going to have trouble with duct access, scale and height, um, contamination possibly. We're going to have possible errors include our sampling. Is it, is it representative? Can we get enough uh, points across the duct? Limits to our accuracy signal noise, meaning you're measuring an operating plant. Um, that's, there's going to be a whole lot of re ready, steady sort of uh, production noise in that signal. Understanding what's signal and what's noise can be sometimes a challenge. Then of course turbulence is going to be there all the time. So typically these flows in practice are statistically steady but instantaneously turbulent or, or unsteady. Um, so over time, you know, turbulence measurements where you can you need to take a reading averaged over two three minutes to get a fair and representative reading might become important. Now, obviously, access to equipment to take these measurements becomes important. It's definitely a really good example of the right tool for the right job. It, it certainly applies here. Then, of course, are your people trained to actually use the equipment? Has it been calibrated? Has it been in good nick? When was the last time it was dropped and, and checked after it was dropped, uh, for example? Um, the other option, of course, is you might have permanent metering points. Are they calibrated? Are they accurate? Annual bar systems and large ducts are a really good example. If the duct flow isn't uniform, are they located in a good spot or a bad spot? Then the other thing, of course, with the flow meters is obviously densities, temperature, pressure correction can become important. So flow measurement typically is done via velocity. So we need some sort of cross-sectional area to convert it to a volumetric measurement. We're going to have to have an access hole into the duct. Okay, and they need to be located um, in appropriate places. So generally, you don't want them immediately before or after a bend and changes in transition and obviously after damper valves and the like. So you want to have sort of generally as a rule of thumb at least uh, one if not a, a few more duct diameters from an obstruction before you do your measurement. Now, you may be familiar with these sorts of recommended sampling uh, guides for different ducts. There's similar charts available for rectangular ducts and, uh, and square ducts and the like. But obviously, accuracy comes back to repetition, repeatability, and uh, and being able to uh, to to get a representative. Uh, measurement of the flow across the ducts. As the, the ducts are smaller, you can get away with less points here. You're sort of seeing, interesting that they're not worried so much about the centre. It's more about understanding the, the, the nature of the boundary layer inside that internal flow. And obviously, as the ducts get bigger, they add the multiple points to get a better cross section. The main thing to remember is, is your method repeatable? And if you go back and do the measurement again, do you get comparable results or are they all over the show? If they're all over the place, then Generally, it means there's something not quite right with the process control or it's unfortunately your measurement method. Here's a really good example, um, just very quickly. This was a, an example that we used in one of our fan workshops an, a number of years ago in, in the laboratory here. We had a centrifugal fan with a sort of a contraction in the duct after the fan, a straight section of duct, then a uh, curved section, then another straight section of duct, and then a, um, an open end to atmosphere. So one is at the fan inlet, just after the fan, the outlet, um, downstream after a bit of flow development length, then round the bend, and then two more measurements, and then one at the outlet. Now what's interesting, of course, is when you compare the measurements, you'll notice that we were using a, um, a vein anemometer, um, with a hot wire anemometer, then we've got another hot wire, then we've got pitot tubes and the like. What you'll notice very quickly here is one is undershooting the flow rate. So clearly the flow rate three, four and five are actually fairly representative. Six is a little down because you struggle to capture all of the flow at an open exit like that, so it's not a good place to measure. You're better off coming back from the exit in here, you'll get a better result. And so the flow rate's probably sitting somewhere in there at about 
in reality. Now what's interesting, why is one undershooting? As we try and measure the airflow coming into the open contraction into the fan inlet, we're going to struggle to fully capture that flow rate just by nature of the open ended inlet and that's manifest by the uh, undershooting um, measurement of the flow rate. Now what's interesting on two at the outlet to the fan measured with the hot wire, you'll see that we quite substantially overcompensate for what the flow rate truly is. Now the reason for that is because the hot wire is picking up all of the, or a significant chunk of the velocity components in the airflow, and so we've not just got the axial velocity component, there's also uh, some in-plane velocity components associated with the, uh, the uh, momentum of the fan, and this is ultimately with good uh, duct design going to be recovered in the form of static pressure recovery and a conversion of that dynamic head back into, uh, into uh, static pressure further down the duct. So generally when you're taking measurements immediately after the fan or some other obstruction, you will, especially with a hot wire, you will overcompensate and record a higher velocity than the true flow rate at that point. Um, this is a particularly severe example in practice that a 20 to 30 percent oversheet is quite common, where here is, it's nearly double, or actually yeah, about double. So lesson learned here is be very careful where you take your measurement, and sometimes of course the other thing is, is instead of doing a direct flow measurement, there might be another way through say heat transfer, where you've got a more reliable measurement of say a water temperature in and out, or amount of steam being condensed, or the like. So for non-uniform flow, we're going to require a lot more measurements, um, multiple locations, but then as we've said earlier, are they repeatable? Do we understand what's happening in the flow field? Now, unconfined flows are very difficult to measure, so this is the flow at the inlet to the fan and the open duct coming out, so going to be a real challenge and, and generally as I've put there, mostly a waste of time, you, 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 you're better off trying to get a decent measurement in a contained duct. And obviously several duct lengths um, or duct diameters away from uh, obstructions and corners are ideal. Um, Got to be careful however, as it says there, um, flow branches and process, process flow changes, you want to be mindful of where they occur in relation to where your measurement's being taken. Now of course the other thing you want to look and double check is, is a process data backup in terms of you've measured a flow rate, does that ring true in terms of a mass and energy balance? Um, you know, across a heat exchanger, across a dryer, etc. You know, what other process variables can you use to verify that your measurement's uh, reasonable? Now, what's that? Okay, so, um, just as we, well, we've got a question that's come through with regards to the flow measurement around the hot wire, and I'll go back to it now. So the question from uh, from the guys at New Zealand Steel is, if we use the hot wire that we used at two further down the duct, so you'll notice here that three was also measured with the hot wire, and then four and five were with a pitot. So you can see, Three is slightly overshot compared to the pitot tube. Um, there's a couple of things going on there. So yes, you can get a good measurement if, if you're in a good spot for the flow with the hot wire, especially true for, for turbulent related flows, and we'll cover that in just a minute. Um, however, the other there's some challenges with a pitot. So four and five could be slightly undershot if they didn't have the thing, the pitot tubes correctly aligned with the flow. Um, but yeah, so in answer to your question, guys, um, you you generally won't get the overshoot if you're measuring in the right location. So um, yeah, I'll get you to check that they're happy with that, Marty. Um, okay, so where are we here? Yeah, so balancing things out. So just very quickly, I don't want to take too much time today reviewing this, um, but obviously a pitot tube. Is generally good over 10 meters a second, incredibly inaccurate under 5 meters a second. It's good for high temperature, good for high velocities, provided your DP cell in your unit can handle the high pressure. Um, Got to be careful that particle laden flows can block the dynamic port and then obviously give you a poor reading. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, the, the downside, of course, is you do need to know a lot about your gas density to uh, know what's going on in terms of uh, calculating um, flows and the like. Um, can also be used to measure static pressure, which is, usual, which is useful. And the key point to understand with a pitot tube is you're going to get a very much an average flow reading as opposed to an instantaneous turbulent flow reading. So if, if you've got turbulent flow, then your hot wire is probably your way to go. It's good and accurate at low velocities. Um, generally, they have an upper velocity limit um, and also typically a temperature limit unless you've got a very, very expensive one. The downside is, is it's going to measure flow over a relatively large angle, which means if you've got flow measurement straight after a fan where you've got some interesting in-plane velocity components, you're going to overshoot. So provided you understand that um, and you can compensate accordingly, then it's all back to good selection of the uh, of the place to do your measurements. Now the other good thing about hot wires is, hot wires is typically they've got inbuilt temperature and often humidity um, options as well. Now vane anemometer is like a little propeller being spun around effectively. Generally, sort of the low velocity range can be good at real low velocities. Um, you often need multiple vanes, which is not a problem. They're fairly cost effective. Um, there's some question marks as to how well they go with dirtier flows, um, provided you keep the, the vein clean. Shouldn't be too much of a problem. Generally, they're higher cost than a pitot tube, um, sort of on a par with a hot wire. Now, if you're going to measure a pressure, okay, so let's talk about pressure measurement here for a minute. We, we need to be looking at the fan inlet and the outlet, and obviously we need to be careful where we are in relation to the fan and also obstruction. So you can see here, this is a really bad installation where you've got a fan a, a, with a duct bend immediately upstream and downstream of the fan. Okay, so obviously you've got velocity changes, which is going to make making a good consistent pressure reading a challenge. Now you can use a static pitot tube where you're just measuring the static pressure where the holes are uh, on the side of the probe. Um, or you can also use a wall static pressure. So down the bottom here, you've got the flow going past and you can see you've got your delta H and your manometer tube, or that could be a DP cell. Now, stagnation pressure, i.e. the total pressure, which is static plus dynamic, is the centre hole of your pitot tube. Now, if that's vented to atmosphere outside, then that's your total pressure in your duct um, relative to outside. Now, if you've got it, tied back into the static pressure in the duct, then that's your dynamic pressure, which then obviously with the appropriate calculation will derive your velocity. Um, so there's a number of different ways you can measure your pressure. Now, with that in mind, we just mentioned the atmospheric reference. Now, this is worth noting, we covered this briefly in our previous webinar late last year. And that was understanding, and here's our system. We've got sort of a recuperator, a filter, a fan, a heat exchanger, a reaction vessel, and cyclone. So you can see our static pressure moving as it goes to the various components, starting at atmospheric out here and venting to atmosphere. And so this is all relative to atmosphere. Now, when we have multiple references, so if our plant is in a building, for example, often different parts of the plant are in different segments of the building and at different static pressures. And so what ends up happening is you have multiple zones. So we've got A, B, C, and D here. So often your cyclones might be a hazardous area, so that'll all be sealed off and will be at a different pressure to our reaction uh, part of the building versus our air heating and sort of our, our air treatment uh, zones. And so what happens is each of these zones has a different static pressure. And depending on your industry, they, they typically, for an internal building, are generally kept under positive pressure, but not always. Um, certainly your filter side of things. But yeah, so it's important to understand that when you go from zone to zone, you've got a shift in your reference pressure um, or your pressure reference frame. So what happens is, is you've got a reference change from atmosphere to our room here, and then a change between zones in the building. So it becomes quite important. Now, obviously, one way of getting around this is, I oh, will just do our measurements and absolute pressure. Now, the challenge, of course, with that is on an absolute gauge, typically 1% variation on 101.325 uh, uh, kPa, of course, is 1,000 pascals. 
and, and 0.1% is still 100 pascals, so that can be quite substantial depending on what you're trying to measure. And so it's got to be really important at times to make sure you understand what's going on as you go from point to point in your plant. Um, something as simple as verifying when you do measurements on day one to another day in the future, what is the reference pressure both outside and in the building in terms of the loading on the HVAC system, for example. So careful planning. And at some times you may need to not ignore total pressure, which is obviously the dynamic and static pressure is another way of going about it. So system analysis is an example. So we now want to really de-bottleneck our system. And so once we've got our system curve, we've taken our pressure measurements along the system and this is going to give us an indication of what each component adds to the system resistance. Now when it comes to de-bottlenecking, obviously we're looking for the key components that are the major source of that resistance. So we could have a few critical components that form the bulk of the system resistance, or it could be that the, the additional system effect resistance is our problem, i.e. poor duct um, configuration and interface and the like. So generally you're going to get the greatest return in de-bottlenecking or any energy saving potential dealing with these big opportunities. Many spool resistances can add up, but um, they might have a, uh, a, a too big a price to chase them all. So you're looking for the big wins that are going to pay for themselves and justify themselves. Now, of course, if you're after that last little bit of capacity, then it can still be worthwhile chasing some of these things down. But generally, as a good rule of thumb, the first place to look is all of your duct transitions, um, and inlet and exit uh, conditions as flows come in and out of vessels and other critical components. So sharp corners, wide angle transitions and diffusers and entrance and exit losses. So coming back to our example, so the question arises, well, where would we look? So obviously the first cab off the rank is we've got a thousand pascals right here in the system effect. And so it would be really a matter of looking and understanding where we lose these big losses. There's a, a number of plants in New Zealand that we've been involved with where it, it's not uncommon to have a 1,000 or 1,500 pascal drop across a very short transition piece. or And it's because of, of largely poor duct design and um, some nasty turbulence and other uh, eddies and, and dead flow zones and the like. And so when you identify these, you can be very targeted and making a change that can free up quite a bit of capacity or just save a whole lot of energy. Now, after you've sort of looked at that, sort of the next cab off the rank is you can see that the uh, process vessel, <coughs> excuse me, and the cyclone have relatively high static pressures compared to the other individual components. And so the next question you probably want to ask yourself, is that what we expect? now? It could well be that that's what the cyclone's meant to be doing, and so this, although it's a large chunk, that's what it's there to do. It's actually working properly, and you may not need to do anything. Now, what it will be is you'll find typically that 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 and our system effect are probably closely tied in terms of our entrance and exit effects. Then, lastly, I guess there might be some smaller opportunities. Is our filter bank not being kept clean? Is it a lot higher than it should be? So there's all these little housekeeping bits and pieces. What I want to do now to finish off today, in these final few minutes, is actually take you through an example. Now, this is a dryer, and um, what you've got there is there's four charts. The first chart to the upper left is an airflow in tonnes per hour based on a number of fan damper set points. So this was a fixed speed fan with an inlet damper. Now what was interesting of course is the this particular fan was operating fairly high at 65% and the exhaust fans on the system were actually at 100% so they were struggling to control the system. To the right you've got the, uh, the same inlet fan damper set point and the corresponding exhaust fans at the top so there were two exhaust fans and then the power consumption of those fans. And so you'll notice that uh, going from 65 down to 35% made quite a uh, difference in terms of the flow rate. Initially not a lot, then it dropped off. You'll, I'll recall earlier, or you'll recall earlier, that I mentioned that these, these system curves aren't necessarily um, nice and parabolic. They, there's some interesting effects that go on, and this is a really good example of how those system effects aren't uniform. They can change and shift. <coughs> 
Now down below here, what you have is the inlet airflow delta P, so the change in pressure as that pressure dropped. You can see it's sort of kind of a parabola, but um, yeah, sort of it's got a bit of a very much a flat section at the top there. And perhaps going the other way to what we'd expect, we'd ordinarily expect a upwardly sloping curve as opposed to a downwardly sloping curve. Now what's interesting here is we have um, the same sort of effect here on a cyclone that was on the exhaust side of the system, which is hence the negative pressures, but you got the same sort of thing, relatively flat, and then it reduced. So this was where we developed the, uh, the system in terms of what was going on in the system and actually did some trials. And I'll just draw your attention to it. the initial set point for this was the 65, so this last point in each of these cases. So what we then did is we said, well, okay, this is actually a system. What the fans do and the energy they use is not actually the key driver here. The key driver is the capacity. Now, being a driver, of course, the, uh, the key driver key dryer for the dryer is water evaporation. And what was interesting, it was starting here, so our evaporation rate of six tonnes an hour of water, and then we changed a few temperature set points here, and then with the constant temperature set point, we then did a series of trials as we, actually it was a constant steam, but, uh, but anyways, constant uh, um, steam uh, input to the, uh, well, the steam valve position actually, um, to the system and then measured the capacity of the system as we uh, went through a change in the airflow. And you'll notice that at a 35% um, inlet fan set point and, uh, and close to a 30% reduction in input power to the fan, we maintain the same production capacity. Now there was some interesting effects going on with the temperature going into the dryer as a result of, uh, of this particular scenario. Now what was interesting of course, in this instance, look, there was also a substantial drop off in the exhaust fans and so there was you know, in excess of 100 kilowatts in power savings. So for a round the clock plant that's substantial, it starts to add up. But the irony of course is, is that not only could you get those power savings, you'd also get an increase in capacity. And so this is sort of, there's a sweet spot up in here where we want to run. So what were the lessons learned from this particular case study? Well, and this is a key take home for today. Don't go away automatically assuming that more airflow is going to translate into extra capacity for your process. Um, fan power savings can be attained without sacrificing capacity in a lot of cases. And in this particular instance, as it's shown, capacity could actually be increased with reduced airflow and reduced energy input. What was interesting here as part of this process, there were other system bottlenecks that were identified, which was to do with the heater and the steam system, um, which meant that you could unlock even more capacity. Um, and the other thing that was, of course, was interesting, the higher airflows were actually detrimental to some of the other process equipment i.e. the cyclones is a really good example, had other impacts in terms of product quality and cleaning and, and other challenges. So it's very important when you look at these systems, it's a really good timely reminder that they're an integrated um, system and you've got to be very, very careful of understanding what's going on beyond just the system curve. So you'll notice with that example, yes, we had some curves for the individual components, but it was equally as important to understand what was my system doing in terms of its output, i.e. its capacity, and, and what was going on. So what are the other process variables you need to think about? You know, temperature, flow rates, capacity, quality, um, cleaning, other maintenance related challenges perhaps. So very important to note that individual component and total system curves are not always a nice parabola, and there's no substitute for good quality data measurements. So typically your savings in this scenario are going to go well beyond just energy. Okay. So just in summary, we've got uh, system curves illustrate the key pressure flow relationships. They're more than just individual system resistant components. We can illustrate system interaction effects. We can illustrate obviously poorly sized systems, poorly sized fans, and poor duct configuration. They need to be developed with good plant measurements. You don't want to be calculating them. You'll be mostly wasting your time. And the key point down the bottom there, one point is not going to be enough.
obviously accurate measurement methods are critical. Um, obviously volumetric flow measurement is typically going to be the most difficult, so looking at other ways to measure it with other process variables could be useful. Um, you want to do multiple measurements to test the fidelity of the data, the repeatability and reliability of your measurements. Um, multiple pressure reference frames can, can be tricky, so you need to be mindful of that for certainly closed systems or, or systems going through multiple closed uh, rooms. And then obviously our system components can help us guide where we need to go in terms of minimising our total resistance and identifying key bottlenecks. Okay, so uh, as we wrap up, we've got a couple of questions I'm going to get to. So uh, those of you who want to stick around for the questions, we'll come to those in just a minute. But before we do, just a reminder, where to from here? Well, these slides will be available post today's webinar um, from the usual uh, website and ECAS website. Um, and just want to highlight uh, that two weeks' time, March the 2nd, we've got our boiler chemistry uh, webinar with David Addison, from the, who's Director of Thermal Chemistry. Um, so the, the link is there, but we'll be emailing that out. And the fact that you've registered today will ensure that you get an email invite for that webinar. Then following March 16th, is, we're going to talk about variable speed drives and their multiple applications and the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, we're having a break for Easter on the 30th of March, and then in April we've got refrigeration, um, getting the basics right, and then mass and energy mapping for process heat systems later on in April. So uh, just before you do go, just a reminder, the ECA Business Program is there to help. There's some great resources on the ECA website. Um, you can check back to our website or the ECA website for information on future webinars. And I promised you earlier today those references that we talked about. The, the DOE fan source book is available as a free download. Um, that's sort of a useful reference um, starting point for sort of the, some of the basics. And then our fan performance, uh, uh, it's only a, a sort of a five, six page um, paper discussing some fundamentals around um, what, why, why the performance fan changes with different bits and pieces and how you need to compensate for uh, density and temperature and the like. And so you can uh, get that available freely off, as a PDF download off the web as well. So, um, so yeah, by all means, if you've got any questions, stick around and, and feed them through. Um, so, yeah, sorry, just Martin, so coming back here. Um, I'll see, I'll see, Paul. Oh, you don't have a mic, Paul, do you? That's a shame. Um, sorry, where are we? Okay, so, Paul, can you flick through a bit more detail on your question, what you mean by your, uh, your S-type pit hop, please? What, what exactly you're wanting to know? And just while we're waiting for uh, um, Paul to send that through. So Aaron, your question, does density affect the curve in the continuum? So very good question. And I've just alluded to it there with that document. That fan performance document has a really simple demonstration. Um, and, and yes, temperature and density does change what the fan does. So if you think about a standard fan, it has a certain swept volume at a certain fixed speed, it's going to sweep that same volume through. And so from that point of view, it tends to be a fixed volume machine. And uh, what tends to happen is as your density changes, obviously the mass flow changes and the pressure um, developed by the fan is going to change. So generally your flow in terms of volumetric stays the same, but your pressure and therefore, as a result, also your, because the densities change, your mass flow through the machine will change, and so therefore your power will change. So obviously, your power consumption goes up the uh, hotter the airflow is to move the same mass flow rate, for example. Um, obviously, it's going to impact on your efficiency. So, uh, um, Aaron, are you, you mic'd up, Aaron? You there? Uh, there you go. You're live, mate. Yeah, no, that's good. Thanks, James. No, that, does that answer your question, mate? Yes, it does. Yeah, so if you you can grab that fan performance by Mark Stevens, it's on the web, or you can go to just about any thermodynamics textbook. The equation's fairly straightforward. 
Um, it's just sort of basic ideal gas law, but rather than uh, uh, getting a nosebleed looking up the old textbooks, you know, there's a pretty simple calculation there. It's only a six pager, it's an easy download straight off the web. Um, so yeah, it t sort of takes you through a couple of examples. Um, Thank you. Sorry? Thank you. No worries. Pleasure. We'll see you again. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's uh yeah, that's done. Okay, we got Paul. Okay, so uh so Paul's just uh come back and said not particularly we just use these a lot as we have a contaminated waste gas stream. Okay, so I, I guess what um what Paul's talking about, I'll see if we can go uh just going to go back a little ways here. So what we're talking about here is it's kind of a little bit like the old pigtails on your um, your, your steam system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So really, all all you're trying to do here is to uh, um, transfer your pressure because it's all about a pressure differential, but to have a break in the line so that you're not going to get contaminates go right up into your uh, DP cell, for example. So, so yeah, it's it's exactly as you're saying, Paul, it's it's just another way of doing it, but being able to protect your transducer when you've got a nasty industrial um, situation. So, uh, so, yes, all the same normal rules apply, but obviously you're just being a little bit more cautious and deliberately so. So I imagine at the steel mill you've got some nasty uh, waste gas and the like, and possibly a bit of particulates and the like, so you're trying to protect your uh, your load cell. So uh, yeah, hopefully that's answered your question there, Paul. Okay, so uh, James, let's see if you're, uh, are you mic'd up there, James? No? Okay, so James has got a question. He said, when you measure static pressure through a process, if you have different duct sizes, would you measure total P instead to allow for static pressure changes related to duct sizing? Very good question. Um, and as actually someone asked me this just the other day, generally, if you're really wanting to get down to the nitty gritty, absolutely. Now, if, of course, to keep things simple, obviously your duct sizes typically aren't changing and so if you're trying to compare A with B, so you do this change and then you're going back to remeasure it, all of that's still all built in. Um, however, to give you a, a, a rough guide, of course, if you go from, uh, I think you do the, the math, if you go from 20 metres a second to 5 metres a second, which is sort of quite an increase in speed and therefore quite a change in area, um, you're still only talking about sort of a DP of around 200 pascals um, in terms of your pressure recovery slowing the, the 20 metres down to 5 metres a second because it's your half rho V squared and it's obviously the differential of the squares of the two velocities. Um, it ends up being relatively modest. Now, if your system is that tight, then yes, you do want to, to incorporate it. But generally, in most instances, it's sort of something that you can uh, make a few assumptions and, and, and be still really close with. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully that's answered your question there, James. Okay, great. Thanks very much, James. Um, so we'll stay on the line for just a little bit longer if anyone else has any questions. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for uh, joining the webinar and we look forward to seeing you again uh, in two weeks' time and, and just to reiterate, though, the this, this slide and audio will be available in the next couple of days for uh, download to be able to share with colleagues that couldn't make it today or for future discussion. And as always, um, if you've got any further questions, feel free to email me um, with our email address and websites there on the uh, on, on the page. So, uh, yeah, we'll stick around for just a little bit longer. And, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So thanks very much, guys. In the absence of uh, no further questions coming through, we'll, uh, we'll call that here and uh, we'll see you all next time. And if you do still have a question, feel free to uh, email it through.